Well then, it looks as if though we're underway. Well, I would say that we now have done our cybertopian duty of spraying the news, but first, But let's get ourselves going, shall we? Thank you, Dirt Goat, for the follow. Good evening, Vincent. Good evening. How goes it? We're here to gather around and read some Cybertopia. A read through. So. Now we are prepared to begin. Forgive me for the several false starts. I had to spread the manure around, as it were, and have just cleared all of the posts. Well, I say all the posts. One last one. Very good. Now then, in earnest, dismiss all that is not our cyber experience, cybertopia. I'm going to go out on a limb and speculate. You may be spoken cyberpunk in nature. You're about to learn quite a few things, though, alongside us. Let's just have let's have a bit of a lark, shall we? A cyber lark and a cybertopia. Cybertopia immediately. Four plans of buildings. Numbers. Money? Question mark. The dots, they almost graph like nature. It almost evokes the, the, the glass panes. It's just a nice touch. The pixel glass. It evokes, and yet it evokes at once technical manual and the matrix with the flow of information down. This is a good cover. And then all the faces of the people dynamically silhouetted, faceless in this corporate future. Yeah, I'm digging it. Blue, strong accent, color choice. Here we have the table of contents. 
I'm not going to linger here over long. I will say this. Our chapters are in a 30-page book. Prologue, gameplay, basics, character setup, which is specifically called character setup, not character generation. Gameplay specifics, game runner advice, appendix, and credits. And these are all hyperlinks, which is nice. Let's go indeed, Ben. So here we are, and as we scroll down, we find ourselves in the prologue. Well, let's find out, Vincent. Good choice of art, and also, note how the frame looks like duct tape over a circuit board. Mmm, the digital fray. So good. Yeah, well, consider Cybertopia on itch, and I should really... Uh... Ben is with us here, and also, if you care to find Ben's good works, uh, the pinned message is a link to Ben's itch. Prologue. The year is 2055, and the last three decades have seen a dramatic shift in the fortunes for Earth. And the human race. Thanks to the incredible innovations of Amazing Core. Once, sim once simply an online marketplace, it, it transformed into a tech supergiant and used its wealth and power to develop and distribute climate-saving devices around the world. It didn't take long for the corporation to grow larger than even the most powerful governments, and public sentiment swelled behind them for achieving what blo global bodies could not. Amazing now controls vast swaths of global infrastructure and have involvement in every aspect of society, largely with the happy blessing of the populace. I say largely because there is always going to be some opposition, whether from competing corporations or unsatisfied citizens, no matter how much good business how no matter how much a good business brings to the world. In order to protect themselves from such threats, Amazing Core set up a secretive agency dubbed Tabula Raza. Players take on the form of these agents with various enhancements and high tech gear, taking on clandestine missions to show up corporate interests and defend them from potential reputational damage. Hello, Nero, what's popping today? is Cybertopia, an indie tabletop role-playing game by Ben Newborn joining us here today in chat. And yes, lo yeah, Amazon's logic conclusion. I, 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 I skimmed the first two pages before opening it up. And I missed the, um, it's like Amazing Core, that's an interesting name for it. Uh, I, I missed this key phrase, once simply an online marketplace. Ooh. We're saying a lot with a little here. Ben has really set us up in two paragraphs. No lean, no mean feet. Content warning. The world of is full of morally gray situations. Although some narratives may be presented very matter-of-factly as black and white. Most have aspects of multiple sides to them, and nothing is ever simple. Corporations may squabble over power and control and conduct this and takeovers of corporate espionage, and worse, but even actions taken out of greed can be beneficial for the greater good. Converse the resistance to those powers may have noble intentions overall, but result in reckless execution, collateral damage, and even themselves be led by people with less than pure motivations. Players are encouraged to approach the game with open minds. Feel free to question the premises presented and shape the narrative how they feel most comfortable. Mm. Also to accept that sometimes the difference between getting a job done and getting the right thing are neither clear nor simple. Hmm. 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 All right, so we're beginning to get the hint of metatextuality in the content warning. This is also possible just a, a way to say shape the game as you see fit. Gameplay basics. As it's most simple, Cybertopia is a game of the imagination. Her players' choices, their choices are paramount, and their actions are only limited to what the game runner to agree with is reasonable. So gameplay basics here is doubling as what is a role-playing game, in a sense. While this rulebook may be may seem quite thorough, it is intended more as guideline, and decisions around circumstances and possibilities should be based upon mutual collaboration. 
between the players and the game runner. I like how we get the name runner in there. Almost like the net runner. Some actions require rolling a 20 sided dice, D20, to determine their success or failure. And players get to modify these rolls with whatever expertise, skills, or items they can justify being relevant. Low roll results are worse and higher results are better. With one being an absolute failure in 20 or higher with modifiers with a resounding success. So these are, quite frankly, overlooked things in a lot of what is a role-playing game section, including my own, um, where Ben informs us that rolling high is good. That's not always the case. It's not always the case in all role-playing games, even. But he really spells it out for us. I think this approach treats it like it's any other sort of game. People know what games are. They just need to know what this game is. So I think to put it as gameplay basics, it encourages more people to read it. And it dodges the eternal, um, should you have a section debate? Because of course you're going to have a gameplay with basics section, right? And this explains the basic resolution mechanism. It is up to the game runner, which ex which actions require rolls, but generally anything that would require more effort or skill than normal day activity. So walking on the street, it's just be narrative, but chasing someone through a crowd would require a roll without any bonus, with any bonuses from skills or items relevant to the movement tracking, depending on how difficult the game or decides the activity should be. The required action, the required results to achieve any success is five easy, simple, medium, average, hard, fifteen hard, high, eighteen very hard, high, twenty extremely hard, high. So we almost purely step by fives, and then we have the 18 slot. It makes sense. This is giving you a quick and dirty explanation of how to do DCs, basically. And with easy at five, I'm going to guess modifiers aren't too common. Or unmodified rules are more common than not. Or all results at either end of the scale may have last, special lasting effects. It's generally rare and detailed in the gameplay specific section. The character setup. Oh, hello. I like how he's li this person's literally like measuring the siding tape. I love it. Players choose their setups at the start of each mission, and the game runner works with them to define the effectiveness and balance of their choices. As long as the characters have access to the amazing core facility they start each mission from, they're able to swap any of their character features. So we can experiment with entirely different setups every mission. Okay. This is why we don't have a character generation. Your character is completely malleable. Your character is a loadout decision. Players are encouraged, but is not mandated to describe their appearance beyond any items specified, but it's not necessary to create an elaborate background or personalities. But this is also not discouraged the players to do so. So you're letting them know you can be an agent. You are agent. You have this mod. You slot it out the next time you leave the Amazing Co. facility. Nice. TD is IDE. TD's idea machines. Saw, dudes. Saw, dude. Where are you gaming, bruh? We're not really gaming, though. We're, we're reading through a game by Ben Newman. Uh, pinned name of the chat. Pinned itch in the chat. And, uh,. Yeah, we're in Cybertopia. An interesting book. Uh, I'm liking the understated aesthetics. And we're getting here towards the meat of the matter. Cores. Every character has a central aspect to them that describes their primary specialism or expertise. I like the word specialism. This is neither skill nor an item, but contributes plus three bonus to all related roles. Swap any of their features. So it is a feature. So the central aspect can actually be removed. For instance, if a player wants to be a, player, be a character focused on sneakiness and infiltration, their core should be stealth. Could be stealth. Or a more physical fighting character might have a core of brawler. This could be considered similar to classes in other games, but there's no rigid definitions or exhaustive list of options. Okay, so you just straight up tell the DM, or the, the runner, yes, I am a stealth boy. And they're like, cool. Every time you do something stealthy, plus three. Skills and learnings. Skills and abilities are imprinted onto characters via download direct to the brain or enhancements applied to the body. Players choose their skills 
sets from their own imaginations within the realm of reasonable near future possibilities and should be discussed and agreed with the game runner. For example, mind hacking would be a potential skill, but walking through walls would be a step too far. Since some players may be more imaginative experience than others, this is a preset list of some basics in the appendix. Janitors and combat electricians starting to sound like bedroom trauma, Ben. But yes, interesting. Hmm. This is a little high up. Um, so. Characters, abilities, equipment can modify it. Da, 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 da. So, we have here an open concept cores and skill system. Example skill hierarchy. Shooting. Hink and accuracy, pistol headshots. So we have a hierarchy of specificity, and rather than telling you, here's the list, although the one is provided, the game is really encouraging us to go with what works for us and what we think of. I wonder what part of IBEW Combat Ocean fits under. Indeed. Character abilities, skills, equipment can modify role scores depending on how general, specific, or specialized they are. Mm. Can't like endlessly. So as you see here, we've got the plus one, plus two, plus three. So if it's sufficiently specialized, as specific, based on example, as pistol headshots, you can get a plus three. So if you're a sharpshooter with pistol headshots uh, skill, that's a plus six to that roll. On a DC scale that goes to 20, that's pretty damn good. Skills can build on, but shouldn't exactly replicate the character's core. Although having said proficient, ah, that's exactly what I speculated about. Specifically related skills is not all mandatory. Starting skills can only be general or specific, up to a total of five points. A specific skill necessitates the relevant general skill. Ah, so equates to plus three. That's total. What I don't see here, although I suppose is implicit, a specific skill necessitates the relative general skill. Does that mean that it's really a plus one to handgun accuracy and then plus one when it's a pistol headshot? Would you apply plus one and plus two for general specific, and then a further plus three, so you're actually getting plus six? I think the text might tell me. Hold on. Starting skills, specific skills, it's relevant. General skills, so equates to the That's the cost. That's the, that's the cost to have it. Mind you, Fate Core, the skill pyramid, having a plus four in a broad category didn't feel right, so I shifted it to the higher. The bonus, the more specific it has to be. Mm. Clever, clever. Learning examples. A character with no gun related skills could roll a natural 20, or only a 20 on a d20 regardless of bonuses and penalties. On these separate occasions when shooting and thus gain the plus 3 skill in shooting. Ah! When another 3 nat 20s while pistol shooting could result in the character gaining plus 2 skill for handgun accuracy. I see. This is how we progress. Oh, I can deeply relate to that, Ben. Deeply. I think that all all designers uh, get to that point eventually. I'm at that point with games that I'm still about to release, in fact. Characters can gain permanent new skills through play by rolling natural 20s. Alright, so you, you tally that up and you hit 3, and very nice. So there's an organic learning system. Skills made to be learnings are considered permanent, do not count against skill points subsequent reskillings. Okay. So you can swap out any of your Amazon core skills, but you can't uh, undo the learning because that's actually something you've learned. Items, gear, and equipment. Items function similarly to skills. This is a very trippy image, and I like it.
Steam, go away. Items similarly to skills in that they grant roles based on the specificity of their use. Like skills that can be found or awarded or even traded for passed around to group. Okay, so five point value. They are plusy modifiers. More than one effect. Throwing star be plus one, but EMP throwing star be plus two. Mm. EMP ninjas. We have a friend whose channel is very much like that. Items can take the form of any object, but will only affect relevant roles. And bonuses from special effects will only be applicable if the item is being used. The specific nature of that bonus. Do you get free Amazon? The Amazing Core Prime. Does the dock wagon come more quickly? Do I get free ammo deliveries? Presumably. Presumably. I mean, they're all getting the corporate special. For example, a mill uniform plus one to search of soldiers, but obviously uniform plus two to one of figures. Pistol plus one range attack. Silence pistol plus two to the stealth range attack roll. Plus one for non stealth range attack rolls. So, as long as it is specifically relevant. Body armor plus one to defending. Yada yada. Bomb suit plus two explosive gusto plus one for the defenses. So you lose a specific bonus when it's not there specifically, but it's still useful for the other shit. Limited only by the imagination. We have Gatling laser and quadrille shotgun plus 40 shot. Oh my goodness. There's a change on Joel kickback. If any of the four attacks. That is definitely more than 50% chance, but I take your meaning. Some examples of the item categories might be interesting. It's available in the appendix section. Companions. During a setup. One can take one or more living or AI companions. A pet, robot, or drone. A simple general purpose companion is a plus one. Alright, so we see again. General plus one. Specific plus two. The surveilling drone. Plus two to surveil. Plus one to drone. The sniffing dog. Plus one to sniffing. It's plus two to sniffing. Plus one to dog. They can be prepared to heal with some of your characters to healing. No, I think it's, to me, it feels light, but we take here that this is the the right amount, you know what I mean? Uh, and these, this is an example, right? The Gatling laser and the quad barrel shotgun showing you that, yeah, if you're plus three, they're supposed to have risks. They're supposed to be drawbacks. Plus three, plus four. Like, quad barrel shotgun, it's super good. The important thing to keep in mind is when players, as a companion... Does not function as an extra character in terms of combat, and the characters must spend some of their turn to direct their companions' actions. Direct complex to do, 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 do take it more of the turn. Gameplay specifics: crits and traumas. Yeah, I like a bit of crunch, and we take as given that this is the proper amount. This is the proper rules level. This is the proper setup. This is a a good premise for a game. All of this is taken on the NDT TRPG carousel as given. And we're just, we're looking at it as it is, and as it delivers to us. Although I relate as a designer with being like, ah, in hindsight, you know, maybe I could have done this differently. But I think that it's all coming together pretty clearly because I really, when you know any aspect of this system is plus one, plus two, plus three, specificity, specificity rolling, like this, um, you know it. And you can now, basically, the runner, even before the runner advice section, has a really strong idea of how this game works. Kitchen traumas, natural 20s, rolling 20 dice. Are complete successes or any point towards a relevant learning? And they attack and create an extra temporary status effect to the target regardless of the defense roll. But in that one, cause a permanent trauma relevant to the role incurring weakness upon future related roles. Reaching zero feature also incurs a trauma in this way. Example trauma could be rolling a one on a terminal bypass, which would then fail, causing electrical feedback, damage in your hacking abilities, making the minus one in the future. Mm. But this could also be making you vulnerable to, protect, to protecting against hacking from bad guys. 
Trolls can be added if the player continues to crit fail on relevant skills. So the player's core is punchy and they're trying to punch through ice walls to shorten the travel time through an ice maze. That would need some balance if they have a plus nine to that action. Well, and they are trying to punch through ice walls to shorten the travel time through an ice maze. That's a really specific scenario. So like, if they just have a bonus to punching, or if they have a plus three thing that punches really good, it needs to specifically punch in a certain way. So I would say you'd really need to specifically be a punchy character with a special crafted with a drawback thermal gauntlet and then can we stack item bonuses and then a skill that is like ice breaking punch or like 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 punching hand augmented weapons or whatever um, and then ice breaking punch like you'd need to be like the plus nine is theoretically possible but that would be re I, that would be really specific but because you can re-roll you, know, you can you can swap all this out at the Amazon Center in the amazing center um, I don't think it's a balance issue they play super specific set their characters before and it works great for their single task, but they still go elsewhere. So that feels like balance. No, I agree. And I mean, what is balance? You're on the indie tabletop RPG carousel. We ask questions like, do we actually give a shit about balance? And the answer is yes for some people and no for others. And in this game, I think the balance is there in itself of if you build something that's bad, you can just swap it out. If you build something that's good, it really has to be specifically good. It really has to be limited. This is a game with an organic series of funnels and plateaus. And it is fairly open-ended. Obviously because a lot of this is adjudication based. And what feels right to you and your group based. There are a lot of caveats one could give about that. Where a certain mode of thinking for Game Runner... Would incentivize certain actions, but that's really true in any game where the there's any degree of rule zeroing going on, which is virtually but not strictly every tabletop role game. Players can overcome traumas by continuing to try roles against them and succeeding three times. And some doo -doo 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 -doo. This is to encourage discourage players from overly avoiding certain roles. If player overcomes a uh, trauma by an extra 20, they become stronger from the experience and gain you a skill. Oh, that's nice. Determine collaboration with the game runner. A uh, minus two trauma becomes a plus two skill. As you learn skills, skills gained from critting traumas are permanent and do not count against. So I like the growth here. We don't, to my knowledge, have an experience system. But we do have a progression system. It is literally based on your experiences in a rather organic way. It would have been simple to say, every three XP, get this many points of skills. We already have a, a buy system. But the buy skills and the buy swap system is distinct from the character growth and the feeling of the character growing scarred and experienced. Cheers. The player tries to stealthily sneak through a secure area but rolls of one stealth. No security. This orientation disorients them and incurs a minus one trauma for penalty for disorientation. Partially blinded by the lights. Minus two discomb discombobulated. Composed from and skill after they recover. Very nice. Organic storytelling to the mechanics. I think this is definitely. You're, you're asking the runner to do a lot, but you're giving them good, simple tools. Assisted actions. Characters can help each other with certain activities when relevant and appropriate. No limit how many characters may assist or how many times as long as the action is justifiable. Detrimental failure. Mass one to attempt resistance does not uh, two to five failure, no effect. 
Minor. Okay, yeah, so... You don't directly transfer your bonuses or anything, but you do make your own tasks and that affects. Preparation reactions. Any character can spend some time setting themselves up to perform better in following turns. Or in reaction to events that occur during the character's turns. As long as it is justifiable, a preparation can occur any time before the planned effect, or can be done as late as the combat round before laying prone or setting up a sniper tripod. These effects operate essentially to assist the character themselves. So roll with relevant bonuses is made and can add up to plus three to the next relevant roll that character makes. The effects gained from preparatory actions only last as long as justifiably relevant. So if the character raises themselves for an incoming attack, that it will be lost once the character moves again. Preparation... This can also have allow characters to react to events during others' turns in much the same way. Blind up position to shoot if an enemy attacks a teammate. In this context, the characters will take their reaction turns as soon as the condition is met. Now they're having to wait until the next turn. This performs as a free activity It has no effect on either character's turn. If characters narratively simultaneously actions, narrative simultaneous actions and reactions come to conflict, narratively they do. Or interfere with each other is up to players to discuss and resolve what, what they want the overall comes to be. Thank you for Geistanda for the follow. All right. So, you know, you, you prepare to do two different things. Whoa, what's up? Yeah, you handle it. Combat. Upon entering pitched combat, all players roll d20 plus roll and modifiers determine the order in which they declare their actions. So we've got some straightforward initiative. Surprise and attack offensive actions outside of combat do not require order and rules. But if the one of them is attacking, the player is a must decide the sequence of events between themselves. So there's this fluid initiative between players in several contexts. Target characters survive the surprise round. They roll to establish their place in the order before the next round of combat begins and their actions is appropriate. These rules are most ensure that every player gets a specified chance to act each turn, but does not necessarily determine the order of events during play. Rather than each player taking character taking five seconds to act and the last of six having to wait twenty five seconds and getting to do anything, instead play all occur simultaneously and any player can jump into into declare an action at any point or otherwise hold back to what others want to do. Initiative, however, does determine when enemies act and which players are able to preempt or follow up their activities. Okay, so there's simultaneous declaration and linear resolution. Nice. I think that can address the feeling of, you know, people popping in and out of attention during the initiative round kind of thing. And I think that that is what's described here in the text. Rather than each uh, character taking five seconds to act in the last six, having to wait 25 seconds in game to do anything. In game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Example combat turn. A character sniping an enemy that might get a bonus from steady hands plus one skill. Since go rifle plus two, sniping plus one, headshots plus two. For a plus six total. So they roll. And that could also be a plus nine if uh, their core is relevant. Star character might see them line up the shot and try to dodge, getting a plus two one for dodge and a plus two to lose excellent. Nice and we show how specific uh, attacks can be deflected by specific armors. Out of combat always roughly five seconds in game, each player turn each player in turn declares intended actions. There's no limit to the number of actions that can be taken. So long as it can be justified to occur within that five seconds. Combat rolls add bonuses from all relevant equipment and skills where they can be justified for attack or defense. If a player is a skill item that would allow them to speed up actions, this could justify them doing significantly more during their turn. If they choose to use this extra speed, they must roll with their speed modifiers to determine how many extra activities they can include. One, fumble. No further actions. Oof.
Okay, so this is a catch-all for if you have some sort of like accelerator if you try to send Devastan their ass. They can do anything they want with reason which are determined by the gamer. Wowee. Your gamer lets you have unlimited turns. Okay, so the Nat 1, your Frog Nat 20 did it. Okay. So it gates it. It, it. it is only specific where it needs to be. And a foreseen incident is someone being like, well, I have my like cyber accelerator on, so do I get to take extra actions? And the game here provides an explanation for that sort of thing. Any non-surprise attack can be defended against using any relevant skills and items. Even if no defense is attempted, armor or resistance are still taken into account. Which makes a lot of sense. Damage done is determined as the difference between the attacking and defending roll. Oh, clever. The roll is also the same, no damage is done. Okay, so it's not a meets it beats it, you must exceed. If the attacking roll is natural 20, a roll of temporary status effect is applied to the target. Ah! Oh, the modifiers act as an AC. Um. Yeah, I see, I see. To have an active defense system. Nice. Hmm. You have a passive defense and an active defense. Multiple attacks. During the five seconds, a uh, character may be capable of making multiple attacks depending on the weapons used and or actions taken. Each attack is a separate roll and is calculated against a single defense from the target. All attacks must be physically capable of being within the five seconds of the turn, including time to aim and charge, reload, recock, or move if necessary. It is up to the players and the game runner, who has final say, to agree on what is reasonable in each circumstance. Character's ability and stamina may be affected hmm, by making multiple attacks. I see. And so all attacks suffer a cumulative minus one penalty per extra attack action taken. If the character has irrelevant abilities, items, or has taken steps to reduce destabilization, these can negate some of the destabilizing effects. Multiple attacks, speeding yourself up, initiative, these things are going to come up. And if you just say figure it out, people have to figure this out themselves. So Ben here provides the base scaffolding that one will find oneself running into if one runs without, in most instances. Area of effect attacks, some items can impact larger areas. Those events include, but are not limited to, explosions, hails of bullets, bursts of flame, clouds of gas, splashes of acid, etc. The radius of the effect is specific to each but any character got within that radius have to make a defense roll. The attack roll for the area is consistent across the full coverage of the attack, so all characters defending is the same number. Mm. Friendly fire in similar circumstances where the character is caught at close range the target of a failed attack, they will have to roll to defend the attack, even if it's from an ally. I like this. I did this in Ada, where there's a chance that you get hit if somebody misses a shot against someone next to you. The role the character has to be is the inverse of the misattack role to avoid the misattack. If for example, a character rolls an A to attack a target, grappling of the character, but the target rolls 15 to maneuver the grappled character in the path of the attack. The grappled character must make a 12, at least, maximum possible 20, originally rolled an 8, to avoid the intended damage. Hmm. Point blank range effects. Distance to target, I would dramatic impact. Plus 2 to immobile target. Scope, special sighting, scoping devices at minus 55 meters. Use any associated plus. Explosive AOE weapons at less than 5 meters. Characters must try to avoid the same damage dealt by attack roll. So it's sort of implying that like 5 meters is, is so close that your, um, your AOE is going to be at least that big. Cover bonus and penalty. Partially visible. Blocked by thin, blocked by medium, blocked by thick. Wooden fence, metal desk, concrete wall. I like it. Good examples. Immediately understandable and actionable.
Some weapons and items may include special effects on characters, both players and non-players. Natural drawings and attacks rolls do regardless of the method of attack. The extent of these is unlimited, but some examples are listed in the appendix section. Hmm. The point of applying status effects. The characters must roll, or separately from any attack, and then impact the following. Detrimental failure. Failure. Alright, so we've seen schemas like this before, we know. Negative one. Nat one, you fucked up. Nat three, you're doing great. This should have range, you haven't really gained anything. Here you're getting some stuff. Any more time? So the status effects like poison or disease can only can cause damage every turn until the character essentially rolls to remove it. A subsequent a character must make a 50-50 roll that can be modified by relevant skills or items, such as a resistance or medicine. Failing rolls against damaging effects incurs damage calculated as a amount of success. It's missed. So you have to roll to resist, and the difference is that you get the damage. I was going to say, is this now going to be a static, like, one damage drip? But no, there's not. This is clever. I like this. Ben's got... Ben, you got, you got some... I, I would be... Did you envision this originally as this differential-only system? This is very intriguing. Hmm. And it, it, it plays well because if you're attacking, if you're defending, if you're resisting, it makes everything dynamic and it makes every modifier count. Count where it should at the least. And I think that there's much to be said for such an approach. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. And I think that um, as we go through this game, what we're seeing more and more is that the system ties back to the same premises. And that helps make the game easy to learn and fast to play. Because you're 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 growing to understand it. Each subsequent turn, a character must make a 50-50 roll. We've already gone over that. The, the, the apocalyptic scene there, like, almost looks like... I don't know. I, I, I want to read into this image, and yet... It feels like a naked mole rat. It feels like... Is this the 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 red of the gas, the, the green of the gas, the red of like a wound or flesh or like a it, it's it's definitely perhaps it's exactly what it should be, which is hey, someone's fucking with you and it may be poison or disease related. Danger moves in extreme circumstances. Characters may take drastic actions to perform one-off feats. Just moving a huge distance. All right, no extra bonus to the rules, but simply allow us to attempt something that would not normally be possible. This gives no extra bonuses to the rolls, but simply allows an attempt at something that would not be possible normally. However, to do so, the character runs the risk of something going horribly wrong, and the base roll has a 50 chance to either succeed or fail and cause a detrimental outcome. Okay, so it's not just nat ones anymore. A danger move, example. No move 50 meters would be impossible for most characters to move one turn, let alone making an attack as well. A character will must, at must push themselves to their absolute Limit to do this roll, 10s or less. Yeah, I, I did a lot of danger moves on track. A 100 meter dash. Woo. 
mean they must slip halfway across the room and then have to avoid stabbing themselves accidentally throwing the knife at the nearest ally. Ah, I see. Sprint in there. Healing and temporary bonuses. All player characters start at a maximum of 30 health. Generally, human non-player characters have 20 health. Small non-human characters, 10 health. And special characters may have any of their amount. Okay, so these are pretty hard values. And I'm guessing they are related to worst-case scenario die rolls. For example, if players had 10 health, the first time they rolled a 2 to defend themselves and someone rolled an 18 to shoot them, they ass would be on the ground. So I think this is an instance where we see the dice math influencing the rolls. And 30 to 20 tenor is easy to remember. I mean, I played one game where, unless they were a special enemy, all like humanoid enemies had 2 health, 2 wounds. And I never struggled to remember that shit when I was running those, that game. Not once. The edge is automatic on the first roll outside of combat or until the end of the character's next turn during combat. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's John Mac on the first roll, that's a combat. Hmm. So when healing someone, you always give them an unintended effect. Ooh, brain juice. I like this. I can. I think I can tell the effect that we use, but it creates. There's a lot of strong contrast here, right? And we don't have a lot of space in the book. To make the visual impact, and we have an open-ended identity to the cyber future. So I think that this sort of image, with the strong contrasts, the tranquil dead, if you will, uh, with the orange, presumably brain matter, it's nice. Your HP are unconscious, no moves. They can't be moved. Other characters can attempt to revive. Even though relevant skills. Revival can be attempted during battle, but the reviving player cannot take an offensive action the same round as their attempt. If you rev someone during combat, the revived character must wait until their next turn before being able to take any actions. Natural one or only one on a D20 excluding modifiers is the only situation in which a revival attempt completely fails. The character stays unconscious. Okay, so in general, if you spend your action gaining someone up, you get them up, and you really fuck up. In this situation, another character may attempt revival. If no character is able to revive, further attempts can be made upon entering a new area complete the encounter if the unconscious character is carried with the party. Hmm. It's a per area stroke encounter. Reset. The player characters fall unconscious. The current mission has failed, and the characters awaken back at the base of operations have been recovered by secondary teams and to clean up their mess. In this constellation, characters discover this may retain any skill learnings and items collected before falling unconscious. No, you make some progress. You learn from your failure. Game or advice. Alright, so this is this is the fundamental of the game. This is, this is what's up. Now we're just straight up advice. We have the game. We know how to play it. In just 18 pages. We are cyber toping it up. Cybertopia is designed to be heavily narrated, le narrative-led and flexible to accommodate any player's ideas and imaginings. It should always be expected that the player wish to explore unforeseen areas or approach characters that haven't been fully fleshed out. Such gameplay should not be discouraged, but enabling players' imagination requires some quick thinking and improvisation. 
Study for play. Any role playing game is important for all the players and game runners to understand and respect each other, especially if playing with new friends or people who haven't played together before. Before starting this first session with a new group, it is advisable to check if any players have any subjects or topics they would be found uncomfortable and definitely wouldn't want to be part of the game. Those lines. Anything they'd be happy to be part of the game, but we won't want to describe any detail. Veils. Narratively, this would be akin to a film fading to black. I don't know if you've ever seen, so viewers know what happens, but don't have to experience it. It would be a good idea to note down any lines and veils with the group so that everyone can have a reminder of what to avoid during play. It would be a good idea to give players an option to at any point stop play. No questions asked. If they don't comfortable with what is happening, using the next card is a good option for this purpose. All four scriptures here. Yeah. We have lines, we have veils with the X card. Use of any of these is not necessarily and play entirely. They simply use to give people the tools to make sure they are in control of their comfort with the experience of playing the game. Once any issues have been resolved and necessary adjustments made, play can continue if everyone is happy to go and screed. These considerations may be particularly important when it comes to traumas. So be mindful of your player's ex personal experience and disabilities and sensitivities around real life traumatic events. Hmm, good point. Carriagen, a good approach to character creation is to present the tempted characters and to discuss which skills and items appeal. Then help the players understand what might work together or build towards a particular archetype they seem to vibe well with. When combat is a particular consideration, it may be advisable to suggest having both a range and blue scores capacity to attack. If players struggle to think of how to fill out remaining skills or item points, common things to be forgotten include items of armor or defense and skills in crafting or medicine repair. Hmm. Ability rolls. Players should not be made to continually roll, interrupting their flow. Rolls should be reserved for specific obstacles and interactions that are intended to produce a particular result. Rolls should also not be repeated for the same activity following a failed roll unless the player tries a different approach. Repeated approaches can utilize the same skills and items if the new approach still justifies them. Roll targets depend on the difficulty of the task being attempted and may be modified depending on any changes to the surrounding circumstances or situation. Failed rolls can have varying results depending on how far below the target the roll is. A roll of 10 or more below the target incurs an additional related temporary status effect. Nice. Brute forcing. Hmm. Average obstacles be forced open with relevant single roll. So we, we have some stuff about opening stuff up, searching, and these this is considered runner advice rather than like the the rules because the the player facing rules because so much of this is narrative and so much of this is call it how you see you don't put it in the player section so they're not like hey uh you know i would say this is an 18 why are you calling it a 15 or whatever and a lot of this is good advice in general that ben is giving us here people are going to forget things being ready in the right direction is good. They're going to go somewhere expected and talk to someone who's not fleshed out. Be ready for that. Very old punches. I love this. Critical rolls. I mean, I was, yeah, and, you know, you're pumping out a lot of traumas, so. Sometimes players may have ideas to know what the trauma could be, but trying to be too specific with them. Too specific with trauma versus becoming very rarely applied in the future roles, and also takes longer to roll successes against or recover from. Some easier to fight traumas in many situations include disorientation, specific fear, cramp, or winding. But generally, trauma should not be injuries that would incur damage or irrevocable effects, such as loss of limbs. It is also advisable to apply traumas that are not the direct opposite of an existing skill for the characters, e.g. a hacking trauma versus a character with a hacking skill. In this situation, the drama, the trauma should take a more specific form, such as fear of robots or security tripping. Mm. The result of a critical failure is narratively proportional to the modifier applied. We'll win a one on attempt to safely refrain 
restrain an opponent using a plus 10 modifier could result in the characters incurring a trauma of lack of self-control and accidentally butchering the target opponent. Mm. Goals of 20 excluding modifiers are always a complete success. Allowing the character to describe exactly what they want to happen within reason the game or discretion. But also increment the learning points towards the new related skill. Progression. Cybertopia is designed to allow players to try with to try lots of different character setups. So there was less emphasis on character progression in general. It would not be unexpected for a player to go through multiple sessions without gaining any learnings at all. As natural 20s can be randomly rare occurrences. If players are getting frustrated by things, they have one or two learnings in, but are struggling to progress to complete, discretion may be used to allow learning on lower dice rolls, but if this is changed, to keep it consistent throughout play. Players can also be encouraged to roll more frequently on related skills or leanings are given to tenuously related successful natural 20s to an ability with learning is already earned. So, we address the fact that the progression mechanism is swingy, it's not going to be consistent across the players, and this can lead to some frustrations. Here is how you alleviate it. We have sinks and faucets, sinks and faucets. We're pouring in chance, we're pouring in the swing of the dice, we're pouring... This is a game, if you like the drama of, oh my god, a nat 20, oh my god, a nat 1, if you need the crit fumble, if you need the crit success to feel special, you need to play this game. Because Cybertopia has entirely built itself around the swing of the D20 of the 5% chance increment. It is all about incrementing this dice, it is all about hitting high and low. This is a great example of a game which is a D20 game, not just in the sense of, well, you'll roll that, but then you'll use all the other polyhedros as well, right? No, no. This is a D20 game. The D20. It's a game about the D20. It's built around the D20. Any way you can get hurt is related to the D20. Any way you can get better is related to the D20. Any way you can do anything is related to the D20. It's like a D6 game. The D6, D6 games push the D6 and its use. Far harder than games that can rely on other dice. I say I'm in a D6 game that uses D12 sometimes. It pushes what you can do. It pushes the shape of the game. For example, I want a D12 because it's a flat curve. 2D6 gives your range 2 to 12, but there's a hump in the middle. It's a more likely outcome because of how the dice math works. If you ever play Catan, you've seen it. Here, we have the D20. And the D20 alone is our guide, and I like that. Because I think this is a game which you like bells, bells and whistles there, but no, really, this is a game that embraces that it is a D20 game. I think more than most games that use it as a resolution mechanism. My darling, her name is Bells. Bells Coves. General characters are very common. NPCs uh, are, are generally either general or special. Yeah, 3d6 versus d20. Yeah, and I mean, you know, 2d6 skill systems exist for a reason. But in fact, I just think that the way you rolled um, roll, uh, d d characters before I ever played D&D was you'd roll a d20 in order. Because that'll give you a stat between 1 and 20, right? General characters are very common and make up the vast majority of characters in the game. They have 20 health and a limit of any set of skills or items. Set up similar to a template character in the appendix, but without any character core. In any of such characters, they could be potentially killed in one attack. They are weak and not tuned specifically for combat. Very true. When you come, when they don't have anything to add to their defense, and especially if they get caught plus footed for a zero, right? If it's a normal character with no armor and inherent resistance, you need to hit a 20 or of up, and if you have a plus 6 or a plus 9, that's really not an impossible feat at all. It's always within grasp. Special characters are much rarer NPCs to encounter. Akin to a level boss in a video game, but generally reserved for special scenarios as campaign finales. They're built similarly to full player characters, 30 health, 5 items, and 5 skill points, except that they don't have character cores and may have special items such as plus 3 or plus 4 weapons or gear. 
When performing actions or abilities on an NPC, the outcome is decided based on the same principle as combat. Contested roles including any relevant modifiers on either side. This only applies for roles made directly against the character like intimidating them or bargaining. Roles made against the character's items such as attempting to hack a comms device or sabotage their equipment are target based and difficult in the item's question. Has the duct tape been getting more frayed every time? Am I tripping? No, the, that phrase has been there the whole time. I'm just tripping. Wow. It's crazy that things went to overlook. Okay. Crafting scenarios. The Cybertopia system is designed specifically to be adaptable to any setting, location, quest, or scenario, and improvising is strongly encouraged. I mean, those two paragraphs uh, were all the setting we needed, really. However, less experienced game artists may find a useful formula below for playing out sessions. Start the players in a safe location at the Amazing Core HQ, where they can be briefed on the situation. Strict objectives, select their character setups, and plan their approaches. The main play of the scenario can be nicely structured in three stages. Exterior locations, scouting approach, entrance, easy, simple interactions, obstacles. Interior locations, puzzles, traps, investigation, harder interactions, obstacles, potential light combat. Objective, angry Sloan, major encounter, significant interactions, obstacles, moderate heavy potential combat. Whatever the outcome of the scenario, it always helps to bring the industry close with a short debriefing and or some overview report of what occurred and how the team performed. The system is designed with one shots in mind, i.e. missions should aim to be completed in a single session, allowing players to reconfigure their characters every time they play, but multi-session missions are not out of the question. Mission types can vary wildly with some suggestions that fit the setting particularly well included. Heist, assault, rescue, escort, assassinate, destroy, defend, infiltrate, investigate, deliver, collect, capture, track and trace, evade, hide, escape. Good. Good verbs. Good nouns. Who was the target of this mission? Friend, enemy, neutral, or other. Is a person out of information, something else? Is the target part of a belonging to another group or an individual, rival corporation, terrorist factions within a group, etc.? What has to be done with to the target? What's start located? So we've got we've got some checklisting here. We have some outlining. It's important to see what each of these steps how players will be able to break the layout. If they enter through the roof, Will they be able to bypass all the obstacles? Can they simply blow the entire location up to achieve the intended result? How easy would it be to brute force all the way through the scenario or just use one method to get past every obstacle? Depending on the game or comfort and capability with improvising, feel free to allow the players to assist with world building around the scenario. They have cool ideas about NPCs, items, or even areas at the location that could be useful in developing the scenario. The situation. The final part of creating a scenario is to develop a summary that can be provided by the player's commanding officers during the player introduction. This should be a few vague sentences and not go into great details or answer specific questions for the players. It can be handled by the drone assisting them with gear and skill provisions afterwards. Short and simple. What is the problem that needs solving? Where does the team have to go? What specific uh, restrictions need to be emphasized? Appendix. Space Ninja. Oh, Temple of Care is nice. Martial Arts. Oh, okay. Plasma swords and grappling hooks. Skill examples. Credits. Special thanks. Sylvia Newborn, wife, playtester, acceptor, encourager of all my nonsense. Wholesome, go to see it. Citri Goody, editor and consultant. Anna Pai, cover artist. Phil Harris, consultation. Dave Cook, inspiration. Playtesters. Andrew Peters. Sam Westwood. Ali Leggy. Andrew Zeminiskiu. Forgive me if I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> Jonathan Watts, Michael Forrest, Luke Stevens, Hazel Bothwell, Joe Hughes, Craig Wilkinson, Patrick Essen, Franco Spina, Martin McNichol, Igor Kircher, Eric Johnstone, Charles Ross, Bill Mackler, Angela Jones, Chris Downey, 
Lay Jones, Harry Edzer, Felicity Rogers, Emma Chi, Richard Stratton, Matt Boothman, Kat Wellsford, Bertine Van Hover, Ahmed El Badawi, Natalie Winter, Joe Neves, Gary Kings, Sophie Greens, Sarah Ford, Mark Richards. I had some S's on the names, didn't go there. Contributors Ali Trota, Stefan Duman, Angela Jones, David Blandy. Attribution Background and front page covers art created using vector images from FreePick and Picky Superstar. Placeholder illustrations from Pexels and Unsplash. Very good. Let's look more at the appendix characters. A mutant reptile, an animal whisperer, a trickster, a cybersecurity expert, a suave psychic, a field medic, a proto biochemist. I imagine this is pushing the limit if wall walking through walls is a question, but I like that this is included here as an example of like this is what you and your players agree to, you know what I mean? You can go this far, you can have mind reading. Combat mechanic, weapon modification, toolkit, arc welder, gauze pistol. Hmm. 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 Got Rise and Torch Dark. Yeah, so this is a pretty short and sweet game. A fairly straightforward one as well. If you're interested in hearing this action, I've done it. I'm done. I've been doing an actual play of it under the same name, Cybertopia AP. That's wonderful. And Ben, Cybertopia AP. Where can we find the Cybertopia AP? Oh, is a podcast? Yeah, 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 okay. Um, yeah, we have it on the Ben Newman YouTube, I see, and all the podcast places. Very low, it drops a subscription. Um, we've had the itch up the whole time, so for this portion, I will pin. Consider checking out... I should have done 01 Thieves in the Nightclub, which, by the way... Lovely play on words, Ben. Um, yeah, so Ben is also a designer and a sharer of actual plays, as am I, in this circuit of, of development. There's much to be done, and uh, always more to do in less time. I think that this is a game, again, about the D20, and about the story that you want to tell, and if you have a group of people who are interested in The highs and lows of the Nat 1, the Nat 20. And who really do not feel the need for other dice. This is probably the system for you. And it's so general it would not be that hard to run in almost any setting. Even though a lot of the advice does back up the Cyberpunk basis. Have you made other games with similar settings, Ben? Or is Cybertopia the only instance of this uh, general me mechanism? Liking this, it's is it's very potent, and I mean you know we could easily draw up a new, uh, you know, status effect example lists in the appendix. You know, bow, sword, shield, yada yada, crossbow, uh, crossbow and swords are already here. You really just not whips. You really just knock out a bunch of these. Smoke inhalation. Compromise tech. Rage. Numbness. Pheromones. Telepathy. 
Technopathy, flexibility, fearless. Destroyeds. Again, I love this cover. The number, the way it shifts, the numbers, tactical manual meets Matrix vibes. Almost like reboot in a way with the uh, the descending cubes. I dig it. Amazing that you gave us two, two paragraphs, and it was really all we needed for setting. Obviously, it's meant to go general cyberpunk game, but it's nice. Ben, I have a question. In terms of the game runner advice, um, brute forcing and searching, you felt necessary to include, but not in the main gameplay section, but rather in the game runner advice. Would did this come out of play testing and experience of people are going to want to do these things, and you're going to want to have runner facing advice, but you're not going to necessarily want to have hard codified rules around them? I'd be interesting to hear where that came from. Because it is, uh, it's, a, it's a decision that makes a lot of sense. Into the scene. Definitely a, a narrative game that can swing on the dice. Because it, it always makes it feel special. You get these special effects, you'll find an item that's special and developed. I know, I um, I hope I didn't uh, rush it, I was, I've, I've had recent ones where I don't get through them by the end of the stream, and I, I always feel bad that I don't necessarily like showcase the whole book, but it was a very easy read. Um, but yeah, Ben, I don't know if you heard me ask, but is there a reason why... Like, was, did you come from experience in playtesting, or did you just know from jump, brute forcing and searching, go and the game runner advice? There's a core book with 10 missions and more lore and stuff. Well, 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 well. You know, I think you actually told me that, and I think I'm very silly. Let's, let's, hold on. Documents, tabletop RPGs, carousel. Check my downloads. Cybertopia. That's on your uh, itch, right? As well? Let me check. Okay, so you provide the system for free, and if somebody wants a bit more setting and missions pre-done for them, they can pay. Yeah, that's, I, I like that. I like distributing the system. Um, is a Google Doc called the... No, that, that's, that's a different game. You showed me the space between, which we could also look at. Which I'm assuming because you sent it to me in this context, you'd be open to us looking at. Although I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna swap if uh, I, I, I expected to be rounding out closer to two p.m. the end of Cybertopia. The brute force insurgency stuff, yeah, probably should be in the place. No, 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 no. I, I actually think that. I think those sections make sense here. 
because if this is in the player section, they might be like, oh, well, this is the DC, right? Like, you should let me through if I get this. Whereas, and maybe the runner wants to run it different. Maybe the, I mean, it's valid to move it where we'd like, but I see a lot of wisdom in keeping these here so that the runner is the one who's being presented this and being presented as a choice and a baseline to modify and not as something that hangs over them by virtue of being in the other parts of the book. I think that there is a wisdom to it. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. The narrative of their choices being what drives them is definitely cogent to the core of this game, what I felt throughout. You should not be limiting them. You should not, like, I mean, you present a skill list, but it's an appendix. You know what I mean? Like, even there, it's like, no, think up what you've got in your skills. Just tell me, and we'll put it in the system. It's a very appealing sort of game for a variety of reasons, and it introduces a variety of design challenges. And I think you handle them all well. I think you, you cover you cover more than enough. The space between, I do love that, but it could just... Yeah, let's have a look. The space between. I'm sorry to say that you've died. I'm also afraid that you have unfinished business, and because of that, you can't get to move on to the everlasting peace. That said, hope is not lost. You will have some time to tie up those loose ends and get on your way through. Space Between by Ben Newman. First thing first. This is a role-playing game for one player. Another person can act as the world narration if you wish. And you need just one six-side dice to play. The first decision you make is a setting. This can be anywhere from any time. It will impact the situation to be resolved. As well as the matter of your death. Speaking of which, when did you, how did you die? This can also affect your unfinished business. Were you murdered after find to reveal the killer? Was it an accident? You want to help someone understand they weren't to blame? Or maybe your death just interrupted something important you were doing. Isn't it isn't absolutely necessary to know what your unfinished business is before we start. Once you get into the story, this may reveal itself organically. One last thing before you start. Pick a sense to be the way you can still interact with the mortal plane. However, this is also the sense by which living things can still detect your presence. It could be helpful to relate this sense to the manner of your death, e.g. taste after being poisoned, or sound after being hit by the bus with a blaring horn. Next things next, there will be up to five scenes to progress through, with the final one determining whether you move on to the afterlife. Each scene will be able to interact using only one sense you've not used before. Decide what you want to try to do narratively before you roll, then take a single dice and aim for the result to be more than your current passing on marker. If it reaches zero, the game ends. The outcome of rolls determines your actions to your attempted interactions with the world. This will allow you to progress towards completing your unfinished business as hoped for in that scene. A failed roll causes non-player characters to become a little on edge. Two failed scenes result in them actively trying to escape you. After two failures, someone will attempt to destroy you. If you fail at this point, your soul becomes completely decimated. But if you succeed, you'll just satisfy your goal and you can move on. Mm. We've got a pretty tight, pretty tight reso here. Scenes it can be shorter or as long as it feels right for you and your story. You needn't be all the same length. Taking the scenic route. Ah, Ben, you slay me. Play begins in the aftermath of your death. The primary, the UU hacker show, if you will. The primary objectives should be to figure out the immediate circumstances of your death. There could be your murderer walking away through a crowd that's gathered around your corpse, and you may try to push through to grab their shoulders in time to see their face. Your loved one could be finding your body struck by lightning after they arrive late. To meet you and could try to whisper a heartfelt goodbye in their ear. Following the scenes depends on the previous roll results. On whether you're feeling murderers and you're fleeing murderers aware of your being followed or if your grieving lover is afraid of your presence. Do you show them a vision or affect the taste of the meal they're making? With a second failed non-player character failed role, non-player characters become fully aware of you and are afraid. Perhaps trying to flee or protect themselves from you. 
Do you remember your efforts? Go to a different angle, get things back on track. As two failed rolls, an exorcism will be attempted. This could be like an occult ceremony or well meaning but tearful spiritual cleansing. Rolling successfully on this scene results in the complete destruction of your spirit. A resistance roll allows you to take advantage of the process to fulfill your purpose. Wreak, vengeance, wreak vengeance on your killer or give your loved one the relieving release they need as you pass on. If four scenes have been played without reaching any point of exorcism, a fifth and final scene is played in which you can describe the successful fulfillment of your post corpus goal. No one is required. You may use any or all of the scenes turned out of the scene as you wish. Does your killer profess remorse and turn themselves in? Does your widower write a beautiful eulogy and move on with their life? You decide and then you disappear into the tranquil ether forevermore. So, simple one page, largely alone, uh, but potentially with a narrator game. Fairly straightforward. You take a single dice and aim for the result of the passing armor, mark, which is a three. A failure is the number one. If it reaches zero, the game ends. So you're more likely to succeed as you get closer to failing. The rolling just never fell right, really. At a blush, I can see the appeal here and where we're going because the marker is pushing you closer to zero which is defeat but also the pushing towards zero makes you more successful i would say hmm there's a lot of directions one can take this when the constraints of a one-page rpg with a high narrative focus and a solo play primary mode where, you know, it's like trying to sprint but walking through a series of turned over tires, right? Like your your stance is very important and you can't lose balance. There's a couple of ways I could take this. I could see you taking this. One, instead of a passing on marker you have passing on tokens. You give these tokens some way to interact, just being re-rolls or changing the difficulty or making something true about the world or giving you access to an additional sense for the scene. Uh, but when you're out of them is when you disappear. So you could be in a situation where you send your last token to fulfill your wish. Like electrifying some water your killer is in. The scene formation idea is still going to remain fairly freeform. Although we do want the ability to potentially discover this through the course of play, what happened. Perhaps, in some way, the dice roll could be more of an auguring of events. Because the player isn't... Yeah. I think maybe... A die, a die roll, which, if we keep with these six, is auguring the direction of events. And you have... Some tense fading decisions to make as your spirit goes out. And you have to choose is this the moment you make your play? And I would say make them choose before the roll. Because otherwise you're going to have a lot of obvious answers. But well, really, regardless of how you wind up doing it, if we assume that the dice are, there's some way to move the dice and the dice are going to impact the future and the outcomes in some way, right? 
Um, hmm, let me think about this. Yeah, I would say that that would probably be a pretty important impact. Or a potential series of impacts. Now, that's not the only way to do it, obviously. You could adjust the six. I really like um, that every time you fail, it moves closer to zero. You could literally keep this dice rolling mechanic and just put the resources in the hands of the player. You keep the passing on marker, but you have spirit tokens. And maybe zero or no tokens ends the game. This paragraph is sort of an, uh, a flash forward to the last things last. So I don't know if you could... I'm not saying there's no reason to not be redundant, but with the, uh, the space economy of a one-pager, particularly because I'm presenting potential additional complications, you might clip this and move here. Not to, not to give like hard suggestions here on the Indie Tabletop RPG Carousel, but... I definitely feel like there's room. There's room here to reconfigure. Uh, overall, though, I think this is good. And uh, yeah, space economy is tricky. One page, man. I never do it. I always tell myself I'm going to do it. And then I wind up on like five. And then I wind up even further. And I'm like, oh, maybe I'll call it a pamphlet game. But. This is solid, Ben. Um, and be aware that there is uh, there's more Cybertopia out there in the big wide world, and um, the core book is, expands beyond the rule book. If you pay twenty dollars or more on Cybertopia. Check it out on Itch, and check out Ben in general on the web. Um, ben is a very cool cookie, and there are obviously some cool games out here, and Ben is doing a P uh, in the pinned right now. So keep that in mind. Um, here on Diesel Shot, we are presently selling stock art, so anybody's into that, um, feel free to come around. Uh, mostly of the fantasy variety at the moment but we're going to move into sci-fi next and we have live streams tuesday barrow trauma monday pyro D, D, tuesday wednesday thursday we have change stars dev streams finishing up the game with layout and all and that is presently our lineup of course ben and uh, it's a great game and i i recommend anybody check it out Particularly anybody who's really into the who like you like narrative games, but you also love the swing of the dice, or who's just really into d20s and wants to see a game that really does it all with our one polyestahedral darlings. Also, you made great use of because you only have like the one frame, but like it's so good. Like, it's, it, this is, like, just you've got just enough and just placed right to really give the sensation that we're, you know, seeing something. It's, it feels very legit. It was in the Abortion Fund bundle on Itch last year, so many people probably already have it. Wonderful. Well, if you contribute to that bundle, check your codes. Like, you know, Itch and um, Humble Bundle. You know, you, we frequently have more games than we realize. But, um, I think that is all for now. Um, I will be back in the future, and Ben may be as well. But for next week, I am possibly going back to another Jess game, or possibly doing another one in the sequence. I'm going to figure that out. Um, so, not this weekend. But thank you all for coming out, Dreamers. It's been a lovely time.
And until next time, dream on, etc., etc. We are going to. Techno. Fairly well.